Hello everyone and welcome to Switch Up. Today we have a multi-review video for you. This includes four games which came out over the last couple of months that we either didn't get around to reviewing at the time or they just didn't quite warrant their own dedicated review. The four games in question are SNK vs Capcom The Match of the Millennium, Stubbs the Zombie, No Reload Heroes and Grey Skies A War of the Worlds Story. Will any of these games make the hallowed ground that is the gamer's backlog or are they definitely worth passing on? Well, I'm Glenn Bolger, thank you to the respective publishing teams for the review codes, and now, let's find out. SNK vs Capcom The Match of the Millennium is a crossover fighting game that released for the Neo Geo Pocket Color back in 1999. It features characters from a number of SNK franchises such as King of Fighters, Fatal Fury and Samurai Showdown, and from Capcom franchises such as Street Fighter and Darkstalkers. There are 18 initial characters to choose from, as well as another 8 to unlock. When it comes to the controls, it has a simplified control scheme of two attack buttons and jumping being assigned to the D-pad as is standard for fighting games. Despite the two button scheme, you can perform a fair few moves and there is a digital version of the original instruction manual included which lists the moves for every character. There is a tournament mode available which puts you against various characters in best of three bouts and you can choose to play with a single player or with tag teams. There are even story related cutscenes in between some fights which I was pleasantly surprised by and these will change depending on whether you pick a Capcom or an SNK character. It's actually a pretty challenging game, the endurance matches at the end take some beating and it's definitely the most difficult of the pocket fighters I've played which I really appreciated. If you are struggling though, there is a rewind feature found in the menus accessed by pressing the minus button. As well as tournament mode, you have the Olympic mode, which is a series of events or mini games that earn you points and these points can then be used to unlock special moves for each of the characters. As well as fighting based events such as First Strike and Survival, there are games based on other SNK or Capcom franchises such as a Game & Watch style minigame where you must grab the treasure using Arthur from Ghost & Goblins, a dance rhythm game and also a shooter inspired by Metal Slug. The graphics continue with the chibi look used in many of the Neo Geo Pocket Color fighters and whilst the color on the characters themselves is fairly minimal, generally using one base color that you would associate with such a character, the backgrounds make a great use of the system's color palette with some looking quite impressive as a result. Cutscenes and character portraits also use color well and do look good. You can choose from a few different borders or zoom the screen in as far as I have done for most of this footage just to make it easier for people watching this video to see. SMK vs Capcom The Match of the Millennium costs £7.19 and regional equivalents are on your screen now. To my knowledge this is the only SNK vs fighter on the Switch so it definitely has that going for it as well as the additional game modes, digital manual and the stern challenge. There are cheaper fighters, many being full arcade versions, but its unique selling point of being from the Versus series does give it an edge here, as do the extra game modes. This game is included in the SNK collection however, which sells for around £35 for 10 games, so that might be worth bearing in mind if you are weighing up your options. To conclude, SNK vs Capcom The Match of the Millennium is actually a pretty impressive fighter, not just in terms of the mechanics, but also regarding the tournament mode being more fleshed out than I would have expected and a few other game modes included to boot. It's definitely the best of the Neo Geo Pocket Fighters that I've played and having the characters from various franchises spread across two companies does add to its luster, especially as it's the only one of its kind currently on the Switch. SNK vs Capcom Match of the Millennium gets a switch up score of 77%. Cheers Glenn. Stubbs the Zombie then, in Rebel Without a Pulse, was originally released back in 2005 on the original Xbox. It's since garnered a bit of a cult following and was seemingly the perfect fit for publisher Aspire, who seemed to be on a bit of a mission to bring us old Xbox games. You play as a zombie who has the ability to devour the brains of any helpless humans he comes across. The interesting twist here is that as you do so, they then join the zombie horde. You can steer them in a sense by pushing them in a direction and they generally
generally gravitate towards the player. The game takes place in the town of Punchbowl, which is adorned by that near future 1950s retro aesthetic that includes hover cars, a monorail, lots of robots. The general aim of the game is to get from A to B. This will take you through a number of different environments and a few interesting scenarios. Every couple of levels, you'll have a dance off. Crazy way she thrills me where you'll have to push buttons in time with the on-screen prompts, all the while scratching your head and wondering if you're still awake. The general premise of Stubbs the Zombie is quite an interesting one, and certainly for its time, there wouldn't have been anything quite like this done before. Unfortunately, by modern standards, every aspect of its execution feels awkward to control. It can feel frustrating to try and get your pack of zombies in the direction you want, and even as you unlock new abilities, the repetitive nature of the gameplay begins to drag on the enjoyment. Now that being said, Stubbs does occasionally surprise you with a completely new style of level. This is most notable when it introduces the zombified hand mechanic, which allows you to throw your hand and you can take over guards, then controlling them directly in a third person shooter style. It was a nice, albeit slightly short-lived mix up of the formula. There were a couple of times where I had to completely restart the level because I was spawned back in front of a room with 10 to 15 enemies with only a sliver of health. Performance is okay across the board, there are no major issues here, but it's also not perfect. There are a couple of stutters, which is a bit surprising in a title this old, but it does have a very nice soundtrack, which takes songs from the 30s, 50s and 60s and had them performed by contemporary artists. Well, contemporary in 2005. And there is some voice acting, which was a bit of a standout for the time. Nothing unseemly happens on this uh, wonderful, uh, sunny, fabulous, sunny, huge, Eyes up here. Stubbs is going to set you back £14.89 or your regional equivalent. It is nice that they included the couch co-op mode so you can play through potentially a couple of times and it's much more fun with someone else. As it stands though, the game just doesn't hold up, not just to modern standards, but even for its time it was a little clunky. In 2021 it was more frustrating and its price not reflective of the end product you're receiving. When it released it was okay and 15 years later okay becomes not great, with many mechanics that have since been superseded by better solutions. These next two reviews were written for us by a good friend of the channel, Dave Morris. He does have his own channel, Saved X Gaming. I'll put a link to it in the top pin comment. It would be great if you could go over there, have a watch of their content, maybe subscribe, it would be much appreciated. No Reload Heroes was a top-down twin-stick shooter with randomly generated levels that released on the Switch back in 2018, but an enhanced edition has just graced the eShop. One thing this game advertises is a 5 second learning curve. They weren't wrong there to be fair, when you begin a run you are greeted with a small room which teaches you all of the game's controls, left stick to move, right stick to aim, R or Z R to shoot, and L or Z L to dash, and dashing lets you dodge, fire and bullets. Your task is to climb the tower one floor at a time, taking out all enemies in a room before progressing to the next, trying to find the warp to take you to the following floor. This game can be played in single player or local co-op with up to four players and there is no friendly fire so you do not have to worry about hitting each other. There is some nice variety in the enemies you encounter and each have different attacks and movements to learn and there are also a host of different weapons for you yourself to use. The big point of the game, well in the title at least, is the fact that whichever weapon you do use has unlimited ammo and you never have to reload which is a nice touch. Defeated enemies will drop spoils for you to collect, but not until the room has been entirely cleared. These include health pickups, extra power for your weapon, new weapons, or XP. You can only hold one of these weapons at a time, so acquiring a new one will make you discard your current one. They are varied in their power and style, such as rapid fire, short blasts, some that bounce off walls, and plenty more. There is a number displayed at the bottom telling you how strong your weapon is, but other than that, it just comes down to personal preference over which type of gun you like to use in shooters. You need to navigate your way through the map trying to find the end of the floor, the map being displayed on the top left which is helpful. Sometimes you'll encounter mini boss rooms where you fight a mini boss, no surprise there, whose defeat results in extra spoils as well as a chest with more goodies inside. The game makes great use of HD rumble when using the guns and you feel the force of the gunfire through your hands. It's never overbearing and I did notice a difference between the guns via the rumble which was great. 
Collecting the XP also has a very satisfying feeling through the controller as well. When you do collect enough XP you level up. Once you reach a new level you unlock a new perk such as increased health, power and movement speed among others. If you are playing in co-op though then you all have to vote for which upgrade you acquire. As you ascend through the different floors you will meet harder enemies and eventually boss fights. For the most part the gameplay works well, the controls feel as good as you would like especially with the rumble and the game is fully functional with no issues in how it performs but having said all that there are some major drawbacks to it. Firstly as you progress the enemies become harder to kill which is obviously a good thing but for the most part I did not find their attacks difficult to avoid they just ended up taking longer to defeat. If you die in co-op then your partner can revive you back to half health and when this happens the gameplay is quite easy. The fights just don't get any more difficult, they just take longer to complete. And the most difficult part of the game, unfortunately, was fighting through the boredom that you eventually feel. Playing this in single player removes the luxury of being able to get revived, so the difficulty does increase here. Although I was often offered the ability to regenerate my health as an upgrade from leveling up, which drastically lowered the stakes. When you die the game ends and you then try another run. Every time you start a new run no progress is saved from your previous run and you begin as if it was your first try. There is just no real feeling of progression as you would encounter in other games of this kind. Getting to a point where I could feel challenged later took a long time to grind through the easier sections and the game just wasn't fun enough to make it worth doing this. Visually the game has a cell shaded look and although things look incredibly basic there are a lot of bold colours that pop and everything is clear to see. Both enemy and character health bars are always on display which was useful and the game keeps every pickup you find labelled no matter how many times you encounter them. The music has a techno feel to it which is fast paced to match the action of the game and it does keep you motivated to continue. No Reload Heroes Enhanced Edition cost £19.99 and regional equivalents are on your screen now. Now this is where the game truly suffers. You see the original cost just £8.99 and I actually played the original version as well just to compare the two and see how this Enhanced Edition justifies the increased price. From what I could tell the main mode is the same although there is no HD rumble in the first game but the Enhanced Edition does add a new multiplayer mode called Zone Contest. It's a basic mode where you need to stand in the centre square until you gain enough points to win whilst the other players try to take you out. It's a fun little distraction but nothing more in depth than a typical mini game you'd find in a party game collection. To conclude this enhanced version plays just like the first one with very little added and even without this it's just an overly simplistic experience that becomes boring unfortunately after a while with no real sense of progression. My time with the game varied between getting frustrated in single player and losing all my progress or becoming bored in co-op because of how mundane the gameplay is when the enemies take so long to kill. No Reload Heroes Enhanced Edition gets a switch up score of 56%. Grey Skies A War of the Worlds Story is a third person stealth exploration game set within the story of the War of the Worlds. You take control of Harper, a woman who begins the game by surviving a plane crash and you follow her progress as she escapes the wreckage and tries to survive among the carnage that is now happening. The gameplay focuses on exploration and stealth with a bit of light puzzle solving. This mostly comes down to the game loading up an area for you to explore and it gives you a basic objective such as find a key to a basement and you search around. You simply use the left stick to move, right stick to look around, A and Y for interactions when prompted, B to crouch and L to run. For a lot of it I found myself simply wandering around an area aimlessly for whatever it was I was meant to be looking for and just hitting the Y button over and over again until I got lucky and happened to walk over an item. When an area loads and my objective was simply look around it resulted in me doing just that and it was incredibly tedious. When searching the house at the start Harper kept on getting stuck in doorways and when I eventually found myself a car to escape the area I was greeted with some of the worst driving controls I've ever experienced in a game with no direction given to me as to which way to go. Shortly after this I encountered another human and the game immediately described him as an enemy that needed to be eliminated although narratively it made no sense at all for Harper to assume he was evil. Maybe a cutscene here of him trying to attack her first would have helped but the game then led me to drop in a car on his head which landed on him with no sense of impact, no sound effects whatsoever as his head went through the floor and his body started switching around in a very glitchy fashion. 
Quite what this had to do with War of the Worlds, by the way, is anyone's guess. The stealth in general requires you to crouch behind things as enemies wander around. Pressing R gives you a focused sight, which lets you see where enemies are through walls. Getting spotted involves them chasing you and bludgeoning you to death. When you're low on health, the HD rumble kicks into a heartbeat rhythm, which vibrates very aggressively even after you've died. Throwable items can be used by holding ZL to aim and ZR to throw, rocks being the most common, and these can be used to make a noise to distract an enemy, but for the most part I found the easiest way to get through stealth sections is by running straight through. You'll outrun them anyway, so if you know where you're going, you'll be fine. Getting caught, however, will load the last checkpoint, which can sometimes be quite far back, and it will make you rewatch unskippable cutscenes or collect any materials all over again. A quick word on materials then, and these can be used to craft new tools or health upgrades as certain workbenches, such as a water jug that can be used to destroy electrical equipment. Graphically, the game has a realistic look to it, and it does not look much better than a Wii game. It does make some good use of lighting and shadows to create an immersive, spooky atmosphere, but this serious tone is ruined by awkward animations, such as the way the enemy swings their weapons at you, especially as you die. The sound effects are okay, although a lot of the time they are absent. The voice acting does the job, but the music is very intrusive. A lot of the time it is just too loud, with no setting to adjust it at all, and there are times where your character will be forced into a long slow walk whilst a song plays and the walking section lasts for the entire song. It's the same with the car section I mentioned earlier. It's as if they feel they paid for the rights to a song, so they're going to make you hear it whether you like it or not. Grey Skies A War of the World Story costs £13.49 and the regional equivalents are on your screen now. For the quality of game you are getting, this is way too much money to pay. Between the boring exploration, the vague direction, the pointless stealth, the outdated graphics, annoying music and sound effects that only sound when they feel like it, this is quite honestly one of the worst games I've played on the Switch. Its only real redeeming feature is that I got a few laughs from how bad some parts were, especially when it came down to enemy interactions. The decision to have infected humans to avoid makes it feel like this was initially a zombie game that had the War of the Worlds license thrown onto it later on. But even if you ignore the complete misuse of the license, this game is just not fun to play, lacks polish or care and is definitely one to avoid. Grey Skies A War of the Worlds Story gets a switch up score of 31%. So there you have it, four games for the Switch. I hadn't expected the majority of the scores to be quite that low, but yeah, that was disappointing, wasn't it? Are you picking any of these games up? Have you already bought any of them? What's your thoughts on them? Please do let us know in the comment section below. Thank you to Mark for contributing via the Stubbs the Zombie review, and a big thank you to Dave for writing two of these reviews for us. Again, please do check out his channel. Link is in the top in comment. Thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support and to each and every one of you for watching our videos. Take care, stay safe of course, and until next time, happy gaming.